Welcome, everybody. Welcome. And good evening to everyone. Um, we are holding another one of our Art Prize panel discussions. This has become a tradition here at GRCC, Grand Rapids Community College, and we have held one every year ever since the beginning of Art Prize. So again, uh, I'm very thrilled to be hosting uh, the Art Prize panel discussion and to have three wonderful artists joining us tonight to talk about their work. Uh, but before we get started, um, I wanted to uh, remind the audience that Grand Rapids Community College has been traditionally involved in the arts and has been a very strong transport, uh, um, a very strong, um, I'm sorry, um, a very strong supporter of the arts. I lost my thinking there. Uh, and uh, has uh, offered excellent arts uh, uh, educational programs. Uh, we have had a lot of wonderful artists come through our program doing successful work in the art world and uh, doing very well in Art Prize too. We have many artists uh, from our community working uh, in Art Prize, showing their work in Art Prize, and we have probably several artists here in the audience who are, in, who are involved in that. So I would like to acknowledge the artists who are part of our prize this year. Uh, do we have here, by any chance, Melissa Taylor? Would you stand up if you're here? Melissa is showing in our uh, Collins Gallery, and she came in from uh, Canada to join us tonight. Uh, we were not sure that she would be able to make the trip, but uh, if she was in the audience, I wanted to acknowledge her. Also, we have our own professor, Filippo Tagliati. Filippo, would you stand up for a second? All right. And Filippo is showing at Site Lab. Uh, he has a wonderful piece there, and I hope that you get a chance to, to see it in person. It's on Rumsey Street. That's where Site Lab is located this year. Um, also, in our gallery, we have an alumnus. His name is Sotir Davidi. He was not able to join us tonight because he has traveled to Albania, where he's from. So our exhibits over the years have traditionally hosted both regional artists, local artists, national artists, and international artists. So we're very proud of the work we have done in exhibiting these uh, artists' work. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce the artists of our panel. Directly to my right, and he's going to be speaking first, is Bruce Thayer. Bruce. And second, we have Suyun Kim. I hope I. And to his right, we have John Dempsey. As each artist is ready to present, I will be providing a small introduction for them. So, first of all, Bruce Thayer. Bruce received his MFA degree from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. His BFA degree and BS degrees came from Central Michigan University. He has shown his work nationally and internationally and has received numerous awards. He has shown in Sweden, Istanbul, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Taiwan, and Hungary, among others. His honors include Art Matters Fellowship, New York, New York, the National Endowment for the Arts Regional Fellowship, and a Michigan Council for the Arts grant. So, Bruce, if you're ready, we want to see the work, and we want to hear about your uh, making of art, uh, the processes, and anything you can share with us. Sound? Not too loud, uh, hopefully. We'll start with a, uh, a little background on my pieces. Uh, most of my work is uh, done in a form of social satire, which uh, comes out of a uh, Chicago Imagist work. And uh, image and word interplay is a big part of my work. Uh, 
I use the images that I draw from the theater of life, which a lot of the images are images that I will develop and use in almost a cartoon uh, format as far as reusing it, but not in a, uh, in a narrative form, but not a, a straight storyline. Uh, and I also work with uh, printmaking, which has been my latest uh, thing, uh, different forms of printmaking, uh, and image making with printmaking, calligraph and intaglio, dry point on plexiglass is what I normally use for, for the intaglio line. So anyway, I'll start with, start showing a few pieces. Uh, the first piece is uh, called Big Oil. And this piece is the uh, centerpiece is a big uh, calligraph uh, face. And, uh, and a lot of the line work is uh, in intaglio on plexiglass. Uh, and I also uh, developed, uh, collected uh, found gra what I call found graphics, old commercial uh, graphics that was discarded probably 30 years ago uh, when the computer when computers came in and uh, a lot of the stuff in the antique marks and stuff uh, I was looking for interesting uh, things to kind of add to the storyline uh, like the word down there dividend check which uh, was a uh, small engraving uh, this piece is uh, 30, 32 by 44, so it's a pretty good size piece. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, and then this image here, this is a 1939 Oldsmobile. There's two of them there, two different ones uh, that I picked up in an antique shop, which Oldsmobile no longer exists. But I worked at Oldsmobile for 20, about 20 years. And uh, so anyway, that was kind of one of the reasons I added that in there. And I also worked at gas stations when I was in high school, pumping gas at 37 cents a gallon. And so the price of gas now kind of just blows anybody's mind that worked in a gas station back, back in the late 60s. So. So anyway, this is uh, one of my one of the prints. This was done in 2012. This piece is uh, a combination print and watercolor, and it's uh, 40, 44 wide by uh, 30, 30 tall, and uh, this was done in 2000. 2001, and it was kind of a uh, my from 9/11, from the 9/11 uh, episodes in New York, uh, the attack on the United States. This was kind of my painting that I did in, in response to that, and it's called Cocoon. And uh, so anyway, we'll go on to the next one. This is a 2014 print called Dog Days, and the calligraph, and this is 18 by 24, so it's not a real big print. Uh, calligraph and uh, dry point on plexi. And uh, this piece uh, kind of explains what's going on today, I guess, and <laughs> politics. This piece is 2012, uh, Fair Weather Ahead, another uh, calligraph print, uh, 40 by uh, 30. And a lot of the writing that I do in the bottom uh, areas here 
is, is kind of something that I worked on in the narrative. Uh, my uh, grandmother was an elementary school teacher, and when she died, uh, she had a lot of uh, scribblings that I had up in her attic, and they were all on lined paper. And uh, at that time, I was not sure whether to incorporate some of that uh, information into my pieces. Uh, but then I decided to do white on black, which uh, uh, makes more of a narrative. Uh, some of the wording is, is uh, uh, more sound. Some of it was sound. Some of it was words. And uh, so some of it makes sense. Some of it doesn't. This piece, uh, Mortician's Folly, was uh, four by, it's four by four feet. Uh, this was done in uh, 2009. And uh, it was uh, one of the few uh, where I started working the line areas up in the, the top of the painting instead of just in the bottom. Uh, This, uh, this piece, Press Metal, was, was in the 90s, 1990. Uh, this was when I was working in a, a, the plant, and uh, I worked on a, a press, a uh, big dandling press, and uh, had a lot of near. There were some near accidents. No one got hurt, but there were some situations where uh, I think here in Grand Rapids on a bumper press, uh, someone uh, lost their arm or something in, in the, one of the presses. So anyway, this was, uh, and that was actually at American Bumper Press. This piece is uh, one of the pieces that I showed overseas, uh, showed in Sweden, uh, Poland, and uh, Istanbul. And uh, called the brute, and this is dry point on uh, plexiglass. It's uh, 18 by 24 inches, and a lot of the uh, underneath red is uh, from found graphics uh, advertisements, probably from the 30s, and. Uh, so anyway, I kind of overlaid the two. Uh, this piece, eight, this is 30 by uh, 28, and it's called the Bully Market. And I've sh shown this piece in the Society of American Graphic Artists uh, in New York, uh, and also at the old print shop in New York where they handle some of my work. And they're right down near Wall Street, so they had, they did sell a few of these. Uh, so this was this was done in 2012. Again, calligraph and uh, and dry point on uh, plexiglass. This piece called Rubber Stamp Man is eight by ten feet done in 1991. This piece uh, showed this in Chicago uh, at Sonia Zach's gallery. Uh, and this is paper on canvas. And it was a way to go larger uh, with paper and not have to frame it, but use the canvas as the, as the structure. And Rubber Stamp Man is, is uh, kind of a uh, catch-all of a lot, of a lot of things in our society, kind of uh, more things there than you can uh, take in at one seeing. And this piece uh, 
1990 is uh, an earlier piece. It's uh, oil on uh, masonite, four, and it's two by four feet. And I did a full show of oil on masonite in Chicago in 1990, and I wouldn't suggest anybody doing oil on <laughs> masonite because uh, the the weight of the of the pieces happened to haul and tote uh, 20 pieces to the gallery. It was uh, this gallery was on Michigan Avenue, and uh, it definitely uh, uh, took someone out of their out of business. I hired someone to do it, and they it was normally most paintings, and when they were done, they were done. <laughs> they quit. <laughs> so it was. Uh, interesting uh, time in terms of the, uh, using the masonite. I think that, that's it. I think that's the last one, so I didn't know if there was any questions uh, on anything. We do have uh, the time for a question if anybody wants to ask it now, or we can wait until the end. Okay, uh, let me go back to one of the prints here. Oh, going over that way. Uh, down here on the side, a uh, calligraph is a uh, uh, printmaking process where you're uh, working texture uh, when you print the print the plate and you can also deal with shape in the face and you're cutting cutting into the plate and you're usually using finding material that that will uh, not damage the, the rollers on the press but will still give you uh, image uh, texture and uh, you ink the plate up uh, with a blue black etching ink which is uh, which you put on first, and you wipe that off with uh, cheesecloth, and then you then you roll the the color on. And I use oil paint instead of ink, color ink, uh, and roll that on to the top surface. So that's all printed at the same time, as opposed to uh, printing it at different times. Intaglio is. Uh, Plexi talio normally is is done on either copper plate or zinc plate in a printmaking department, and, and it's etched in with with ground and and line, and then it's acid etched. Uh, with plexiglass, I'm going straight onto plexiglass uh, and dry pointing, which is a, you have a pointed stylus and you're drawing in all your lines on the plexiglass and denting them in, and you'll have, uh, uh, when you're inking the plate, you'll, all your recessed lines will be the lines that will be printing as opposed to the top lines. And uh, uh, plexiglass is only used, is not, is not used a lot because you can't run a big addition, but I'm not interested in running additions. I'm interested in in getting an image, you know, maybe one or two, uh, sometimes five, but uh, a lot of times with like either copper or zinc, you know, they're, they're running, you know, hundreds of prints. And uh, Plexi won't let you run a hundred because it will break down under the roller quicker. But uh, I'm more after the image and the process than I am additions. No, just once through to get the colors. Uh, everything with a, a calligraph, uh, it's uh, inked up. Uh, with with black ink first, and then wipe 
wipe down like you would an intaglio, and then uh, and then it's you're figuring out your roller colors, and then you're rolling up your colors uh, individually, and then it's all run through once through the into the press, and uh, and a lot of times. Uh, uh, you know, you get things that you're, you're not expecting at times, too, so that's part of it, too. Does that help a little bit or not? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, they're, yeah, they're old, and some of them are old engravings. Some of them are rubber stamps that I've made from some of my images. And uh, some of them are uh, engra old engravings, which like the 1939 Oldsmobile there was probably done in either 1939, would be my guess. Uh, and a lot of that stuff was uh, uh, dumped in the, uh, well, it had to be before the turn of the century, because I, you know, they were, Selling, selling them in antique marks and thrift shops and stuff. And most people were buying the, uh, the typeset boards, you know, and turning them into stuff. But uh, I was interested in the, in the different uh, images done in commercials, uh, uh, advertising, you know, back before, a lot of them were before World War II. So, I don't Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Let's give him a hand, everybody. <laughs> Next, we have Suyun Kim. Uh, I wanted to mention a couple of things about Suyun. Uh, he studied photography, art history, and aesthetics at Seoul National University. He earned his MFA in photography design, in photographic design, from Hong Kiek. University, and he also received a second MFA in photography from the University of Illinois in Chicago. Between 2005 and 2010, he served as the assistant director of the National Photographers Association of Korea. His current research questions the catalyzing potential of art as social change, and I'm sure he'll tell us a word about that. Su Yun? Uh, thank you. I came from Korea three years ago to Chicago, and um, maybe rather than uh, my current project, uh, which is most involved in socially, uh, social activism uh, like that, just I would like to share uh, the uh, my current installation uh, in uh, GRCC Art Gallery, and uh, I would uh, start some the pictures that I create that I created a year and a half ago uh, initiated this uh, this installation uh, the photographic project so uh, the left one is uh, one of my friend who visited uh, Chicago for a couple of days uh, and in uh, in Chicago hotel uh, the fancy hotel room and the right picture is uh, my mother's kitchen in South Korea. And the left one is uh, the, the balcony of a high-rise apartment in uh, downtown Chicago, uh, where I lived uh, for a year. And the right one is the alley of the, uh, the shanty town uh, that I mother has lived for the past uh, 15 years. And the left one is also my mother's calendar, and the right one is my mother. And the left one, I think that, the, uh, unfortunately, the <laughs> image is cropped now, but anyway, the left one is my mother's house, and the right one is the uh, her, her room uh, filled with all the family pictures uh, that she kept. And the left one is the... Uh, a parking um, lot, a corner of parking lot uh, of the Target store, which were built in the uh, the place uh, where the high rise high rise uh, 
public housing project named Company Green, uh, which were very infamous for uh, extreme poverty and crime rate in Chicago for the past 50 years. And the last building was demolished in 2011. And uh, in, a, in two years, they built uh, just a big target store in the area, uh, empty space. And the, the right one is the, the shanty town. Uh, the name of the neighborhood is Guryong Village in Seoul. And the, the reason why I um, picked specific photograph and the tips like this was that uh, it was around the time just uh, I needed to uh, navigate and explore, uh, looking at the architectures and uh, figuring out uh, what happened uh, in the past century to make Chicago as a great uh, city and uh, globally renamed a uh, renowned city for the uh, modern and postmodern architectures. And uh, I figured out uh, the, and also the, the history of a public housing project was very uh, interesting because the extremely poor neighborhood was located in the most wealthiest area just beside of, uh, the neighborhood named Gold Coast in Chicago. And uh, navigating the city and photographing uh, the arch architectures and understanding uh, the, the back history uh, reminded me of that. Uh, my experience in Korea, uh, my mother happened to move to the uh, Shanty Town, which have, has a very similar uh, element between yeah, yeah, uh, with uh, Cabrini Green because the Shanty Town is also located in the wealthiest area in Seoul. Maybe perhaps some of you have heard that the Gangnam style. The Gangnam is the wealthiest location in Seoul, and there are also high rise apartments. And, uh, and uh, surprisingly, there is a uh, big Shanty Town. Uh, and it happened around 80, uh, 1988, uh, Seoul Olympic Games. Around the time of Olympic Games, uh, the city government needed to evict uh, many residents from scattered shanty towns around the city, and they had to find a place to live there, or live somewhere. So they found an uh, empty uh, hill, uh, which was um, prohibited to develop uh, for the military reasons and the envir environmental reasons. And the uh, similarity between, you know, the Cabrini Green and my mother's shanty town. And also the, uh, the Chicago is the city where I uh, has, been, has lived for the past three years. And around the time it was the oh, year and a half like that. And uh, the shanty town. I also lived with my mother for three years before I came to Chicago. Uh, so, what, uh, which, which elements of my environment, you know, is concerning kind of social, political issues, economic issues, the neoliberal uh, policy. Those things uh, kind of uh, pushed me to show kind of contradiction. Uh, between two different locations. Of course, this uh, Chicago, the environment, uh, Chicago is, you know, the, and also in famous for the gun violence, gang violence, and the uh, Carpe Green was very problematic because of the those violences. But uh, the shanty town uh, in Korea, they have no uh, such violence. Uh, just they live. Uh, the poor people live there. And, uh, and also my concern was that um, about um, before, uh, until I came to Chicago, uh, my previous photograph was, uh, one of my concern with my photograph was uh, kind of formalism. I, I, I would say I was obsessed with kind of a formalism. So trying to uh, show kind of abstract quality through the images and the composition shapes. Maybe uh, some of you might see uh, those things. Anyway, so uh, after that, uh, this past winter, I uh, had a chance to visit the neighborhood again to focus, um, make more uh, portraits and more exteriors. So this is my mother, two years old now. Uh, at the time, it was on 
year, uh, years, year and a half old. So uh, my son just fell asleep in my mother's room, uh, the same room. It was my birthday, so my mother served us a nice uh, meal, food, and after eating, just my son fell asleep. Actually, I, I was there to uh, photograph anything uh, to proceed this project. Um, and uh, yeah, these are pic these pictures are in, uh, displayed in the gallery now, and uh, we, so this is uh, just um, uh, this was for uh, billboard uh, for advert to advertise maybe the restaurant or the meat butcher shop. Uh, this is a uh, pork belly, uh, which is very popular. Uh, food in Korea, and the owner of this house uh, probably found some air from the garbage uh, can and just hang uh, to protect the wall because this material is waterproof and this is not much. Yes, yeah, so, and this is a small alley of the neighborhood, and also a small alley. Um, and this is the overview of the neighborhood. And this building, uh, this is the outhouse. So some uh, houses um, have bathroom, and uh, some of them are not. So they share a public outhouse. And these buildings are tallest building in Gangnam area, uh, the luxurious apartment, and just um, 20 minutes by walking, so very close. And this is also the billboard, uh, which was used for uh, advertisement of the high-rise high -rise apartment development. And this is the alley. And there was a big fire last fall. So after the fall, after the fire, just many houses were just uh, left. Uh, and this is a small factory of the neighborhood, in the neighborhood. And this is a facade of the uh, one of the house, houses. And around the time this past winter, I served as a photographer uh, for their, uh, for young people. She needed an ID picture. Um, and I, uh, as my mother knows many neighborhoods, uh, neighbors, so I was invited to them to uh, make the picture for them. So I made uh, ID pictures or some uh, people needed um, just portrait or uh, some people uh, needed a uh, the funerary photographs in Korea, it's pop, it's very uh, user for elderly people to prepare their portrait for their funerary in advance, like years ago. And they believe that if they get one, um, they could live a little longer than they expect. <laughs> so uh, I I'm very familiar with the, those kind of um, uh, uh, photographing. So I uh, made made the pictures for them and I gave them. Maybe in the exchange of um, the, uh, the serving, I could just look at their house uh, indoors and I, I was allowed to photograph whatever I want. So uh, this one is also in, installed in the exhibition. S and this is, this is um, uh, my mother's electronic piano. So through these images, I intentionally put this one and this one. This one is not in the, this exhibition, but was in the another exhibition. And this one and my son's picture. Uh, I intentionally intend uh, put those pictures between other uh, exterior uh, images or alleys or the architectures to present my um, personal identity and also to show my personal connection between the uh, neighborhood uh, and myself. So uh, it was, I, I hesitated, though uh, when I was in, in this neighborhood, I was also, I had worked as a photographer, freelance photographer, um, but I had never thought of um, documenting that area because I didn't, uh, maybe courage, I didn't 
uh, confidence to show my personal stories. But uh, once I came to Chicago, I um, thought about my practice again in different way. To, so I wanted to share my uh, personal uh, stories. And uh, I didn't want to uh, kind of uh, show the pain of others, but pain of myself and, and also uh, I didn't want to be an outsider, but the insider and, uh, and also explore, uh, explore obviously. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Suyun. Is there a question from the audience that you want to ask right away, or would you like to wait until the end? Not seeing any, we will move on. And next we have John Dempsey. Uh, John is an associate professor of art at Mott Community College in Flint, Michigan. Uh, John earned his MFA degree in painting and drawing from Central Washington University. He also conducted postgraduate work at Arizona State University. Um, and his BFA in painting and drawing is from Michigan State <coughs> University. Recent exhibitions include Durham Arts Council, ARC Gallery in Chicago, Buckham Gallery in Flint, Gallery Project in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, Saginaw Art Museum, and the Flint Institute of Arts. Uh, also, he's in collections of the Flint Institute of Arts, the Nature Conservatory in Lansing, uh, Pfizer Research Center, Detroit Metropolitan Airport, Yuma Arts Center in Arizona, and Scottsdale Center of the Arts in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, he's also in many other collections, but I shortened, obviously, this for the purposes of introduction. Um, and John will uh, let us know about his work. Go ahead, John. Hello, everybody. I was, I'm going to use the stationary microphone. Um, most of you are here to hear people explain their work. I thought um, what I would do is I would uh, show, introduce you to my work by um, showing you uh, or telling you about things that people taught me about my work. So that's the title is Things I Learned About My Paintings. Um, This is uh, t an older painting, so it's taken from a slide, a scan of a slide. But this is titled Quench, homage to um, Diego uh, with A.C. Delco Flint. And uh, this painting was, dates around 1981, 82. But I was at an opening um, where this painting was being exhibited, and I was talking with somebody. They were questioning me about the painting, and there was a third party there. and. Um, the, the person I was talking to asked me to explain what was this about. They wanted to know why there was the water on the right-hand side, what that had to do with the composition. Um, and I was kind of fumbling around trying to explain it. I didn't really um, know how to answer that particularly. And the uh, third party uh, said, well, I know what that means. And they explained that um, what happens is for five days of the week, you work in the shop, and for two days, you go up north to the lake. And I thought that made perfect sense to me. And since, uh, when I see this painting, I always kind of think of that in terms of the narrative, you know, the story or what the work is about. Um, and I thought that explanation was nice because it kind of gave a visual to kind of a temporal experience, the idea of a week. You know, how do you conceptualize that? We all know Wednesday is the hump. But the week is, as a whole, if you grow up in Detroit, this is what we did. And my father and mother had a cabin up on Pickerel Lake up by um, uh, Traverse City and thereabouts. And on the weekends, we would go and do that. So it made kind of perfect sense. So anyway, this is um, Quench. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot how I did this. This, <coughs> pardon me. The, the second um, example is a painting that's uh, from 1987, I believe. And it's um, called uh, Touchstone. And this was from a series that was called the Michigan Chronicle series. Um, and this painting here, there are two um, sections. This section right here is, well, first of all, this, this series was kind of chronicling different environments and um, uh, places around um, the Bay City, Flint, um, 
uh, Saginaw, Midland area, which is where I was working. And I started working from more direct observation and working with spaces that I occupied and could paint more directly. Um, this right here is uh, the first Presbyterian church in Bay City. And this is a very rare uh, um, image. I wasn't using images that I appropriated or stole or borrowed, whatever the polite term is appropriation. But this image was a um, Salvadoran uh, earthquake survivor that was printed in a newspaper in black and white. And um, I picked it up and it fascinated me, so I used it and incorporated it into this painting. Uh, many years later, I was reading an article and they were talking about something besides um, this topic. But in the article, they explained that the first Presbyterian church in Bay City actually during the time when I was painting this was running a program where they were bringing um, uh, uh, El Salvadoran refugees through uh, like a underground railroad. Um, the church had a program where they would bring ref uh, people from um, Salvador. They would come and they would be placed in parishioners' homes and they would be integrated into the community. This was back when there was a lot of uh, um, Latin American um, like political unrest, uh, the Sandinistas, um, that type of history going on. So this is just, in a sense, coincidental, but um, it changed the way I perceived the painting um, and changed, in, in my mind, the meaning, I guess, in a sense. So this is the uh, piece um, that's up in the, the gallery. Looks kind of bright and washed out, but um, this piece I'm showing, <coughs> excuse me, because I changed the title on this after talking to, to some um, people at an opening when this uh, painting was first shown. It was first shown at Buckham Gallery about a year ago. And uh, people were trying to explain what was going on in the painting. Um, I th think, similar to Sue, I, I'm kind of uh, working with the idea of place and just bringing different places together for um, uh, comparison and uh, experience, but uh, a, a number of people came up with the idea of trunk. Like they were trying to figure out what that shape was, um, I think for the most part, and like two or three people uh, came to that same conclusion after talking to them about the painting. So I changed, I decided to change the title to trunk. Then, and it was curious because it wasn't elephant, it was just trunk, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and the, the last piece I want to um, show and share with you here um, is one of the more recent paintings. And this is from a series called the Glare series, which the last painting was from, is from as well. This was a painting I did after rereading the um, uh, novel Mo Moby Dick, Herman Melville's novel. And mm -hmm. um, I'm at the age where I'm going back and rereading novels that I read when I was in um, high school and in college, um, and Moby Dick was really high on my list. So I went back and read it, and after reading it, and so, like I was about three quarters of the way through, almost done, and I was thinking about the story. It's a very odd book if you've read it. It's kind of um, part essay, part narrative, part history, part news. It's um, structured very strangely, and I was recognizing the way Herman Melville was uh, putting this, composing this book, but um, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. After finishing it, and a few weeks later, I thought, wait a minute, that's kind of, the way he made that book is kind of the way I think about the, my paintings, because they're not narratives. The, the images aren't brought together in a story in that sense. They're a, a little more convoluted, I guess, is one word I could use. Um, but. I thought, well, that's a coincidence. Herman Melville is structuring this book that I kind of recognize how he's thinking based on how I think about composing my paintings. Then I remembered a conversation I had with a, an instructor years ago, and uh, he was good at questioning, you know, throwing questions out and getting kind of responses from people. And he asked us, I remember one day, he said, uh, well, why do, do you think, um, people read books. And I said, well, you know, they read books because they want, they're interested in stories, they want to hear stories. He said, no, 
they don't read books to, to hear stories. There's only two or three stories in, in, that exist. They read books to learn how to think. And when I was thinking more and more about this, what I was learning, I think, this is where I'm kind of my train of thought right now, is that what I was recognizing from Herman Melville was really what I was learning from Herman Melville, that I was learning how to think not so much about writing, but eventually about painting. Um, and I could kind of recognize through the decades, looking back, how much I was indebted to that book particularly in terms of where my own work um, went over time. So um, in a sense, I guess Herman Melville was the one who informed that piece. So this is um, Moby Dick. It was updated, so I researched the current sort of dynamic in whaling, um, which is interesting story. Um, if you read about the Sea Shepherd uh, and the kind of dynamics between the Japanese whaling industry for the most part and um, some people that are practicing interrupting, inter interrupting that, that uh, um, whaling process. Um, but anyway, it was meant to look at the themes of Moby Dick and um, update them in, in homage to Herman Melville. So thank you. Um, and that's, that's it. Thank you, John. Uh, we've come to this uh, part of our presentation when we can ans ask more questions of the artists. So I can bring a mic back to make uh, these more audible. Uh, and let's see if people have some questions. Anyone? Any of our students? Wonderful. Um, this one's kind of just a general question, but whenever you're doing an art piece, do you generally look for a story in it, or do you just take it because the lighting hits it well? Like, is there a, a narrative or story to be told in your pieces? Yeah, for anyone, anyone. Anyone. Um, I'll go first. I, the short answer, no, because I don't think narrative is the right word in terms of my own thought process. Um, so narrative is kind of a, a more of a writing sort of idea and an illustration kind of idea. And I wouldn't characterize what I do as narrative, but I think there's that urge to narrate. Um, I also kind of believe that you you either can understand an experience or you can have an experience. And once you start to get into that mode of narrating, you're no, no longer really in that visual mode of experiencing. Um, it's like the difference between Friday night and how you explain what happened on Friday night the next day. There's the experience and then there's the, the story. Um, and I think there's that urge to story, but I don't see it as central to what I'm doing. Uh, for me, and um, particularly in photography, uh, the, the curator of MoMA, uh, historical uh, critics and historian, John Zakowski, um, articulated the problem of narrative in photography uh, through the book of um, Photographer's Eyes, a short uh, uh, introduction. You know, he explained that just photography fails to narrative. To convey a narrative because you know, you know you could compare just uh, easily compare uh, photography that with other mediums like painting or um, maybe moving images. But so I think that um, I I agree with uh, with him and many uh, ideas in photography. So uh, rather than uh, showing a narrative uh, through a single image, uh, I would. Uh, I, I am trying to uh, show, uh, articulate 
uh, the context uh, through uh, for many times uh, with multiple images and uh, with uh, sometimes collaboration uh, through the collaboration or yeah between uh, like you know the uh, for example in my project uh, I showed two different places uh, to uh, show uh, another thing uh, so uh, I think that just I um, so when I talked, I talk about my uh, story. I, um, I, I talked like that. I wanted to share my story, but I didn't mean that it's possible through just only uh, one single image, but uh, I would care much about the context in general. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my work... Uh, I definitely uh, follow somewhat of a storyline uh, narrative. I, I know in my early training when I was at Central Michigan, uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, uh, the narrative was a no-no in modern art. Uh, that had pretty much what I was taught not to do. And uh, about the third year in, uh, I started working with narratives. Uh, started with s some stories, but not all of my stories are uh, uh, follow a timeline or follow follow a, a, you know one thing to the next. But in essence, I look at a lot of my work as being in the form of social satire. So I do look at the. Uh, I let things. I do let things happen that that I'm not controlling when I'm working. But I always try to start with a title uh, to the piece first, and then work images off from that title. And uh, sometimes, you know, in my in my mind, a narrative is uh, doesn't have to necessarily be just my story, but it can be someone else's story that's looking at it and feeding back some of the information from that. Uh, so I look at my work as being somewhat narrative uh, in, the, uh, in a smaller sense. Uh, so anyway, I don't know if that helps at all. Yeah, that helped. Thank you. Do we, oh, very good. I'll run the mic over here. Uh, Su Yun, um, your work looks like it, it, it's a lot of social commentary. It looks like uh, what what response do you seek there in terms of like either emotional or just like. What thoughts do you want to provoke in people? Uh, actually, uh, when I visited, uh, when I uh, photographed my mother in the Shanty Town for the first time a year and a half ago, I didn't. Uh, I was not sure how American viewers would look at the images. I didn't uh, expect for Korean viewers, but the American viewers. Then and also, as I was so much familiar with that kind of images of showing poverty and uh, in the urban area, so I was not sure how they would res um, respect or just uh, what kind of uh, res response I would get. But uh, quickly, I got uh, many inter interesting and positive response of just uh, at least to see, uh, wow, there is, uh, is there is is this Seoul? Is it the metropolitan city? Uh, like that, then I uh, and also they uh, liked the pictures, so I decided to uh, go back and uh, I stayed five weeks uh, this past winter. And actually, two weeks ago, I visited uh, the neighborhood again to make more pictures. So I I think that just um, maybe kind of factual information like just when will uh, how it. Uh, the neighborhood was shaped and uh, who built in and uh, how it looked like compared, comparing to 
uh, directed to the other uh, high resolution plasmas, then uh, I think that at least uh, people could think uh, about uh, what the, the capital capitalism is doing. Just you know, it's very um, general. Maybe it might be a general response and. Uh, and I, for American viewers, I, I wanted to show that, um, yeah, there is a, there is an, an ex a, that kind of neighborhood, and it's it's kind of an expected things I think. So, um, yeah, that is just my general idea about uh, showing poverty. And in the meantime, I, you know, I talk about my personal experience. You know, I'm showing my son's images and, uh, and also my mother's. Uh, and so the, I, I wanted to question about what's the job of uh, documentary images and photography. So uh, in which degree, uh, what degree, uh, uh, how a photographer can um, share, uh, show his personal identity as a documentarian and, or as a researcher like that. So just rather than uh, expecting a specific uh, concerns, but I wanted to uh, bring out any question about uh, the job of um, photography in 21st century. Uh, and uh, Well, um, actually, um, I only talked about my mother's in one side. And actually, um, the reason uh, why I lived in the very expensive apartments in downtown in Chicago, a high rise apartment, the rental fee is very, very expensive. And it was for my wife. And we came from very different uh, families. So <laughs> she came from uh, kind of a wealth, wealthy family. and. Uh, her family lives in the not in the direct the exact high-rise apartment you see you saw through the public house uh, public outhouse but that neighborhood <laughs> and uh, I'm worrying about uh, my parents-in-law how would how they would like the photograph or sharing my experience because they didn't yeah and and also actually my mother has never met my parents-in-law. So it's, it's, it's also very, uh, very uh, personal story. But my mother, the answer is that my mother don't care about it. So <laughs> she just support me whatever I would do. And she had never worried about, yeah, uh, being, an, being an artist or being a photographer. Just she trust me and she support me, though she was not wealthy. The wealthiest uh, also, I appreciate, I love my parents-in-law. They support us a lot, but I think that they have a very different perspective about the life. <laughs> yeah. We will take one more question over here. Uh, so Yoon, um, you, when you're talking about having um, the personal images in your work, um, I was wondering, do you think that the work or when you look for other work to do, how important is that personal connection? Um, and do you think that a photographer could make such powerful images without that personal connection? Well, absolutely, they can make you know great photograph. You know, so the the personality or the uh, personal connection uh, between the artist and the project. Uh, I think that it totally depends on the case. So I appreciate many new topographic artists who never shows their presence or another great photographers or the art the another uh, artist. But for me, this time it was very uh, though I needed kind of courage uh, and also uh, though when I started the project, I was not sure, but. Uh, it rather than you know making uh, I mean uh, based on the belief of um, the uh, 
showing the personal connection uh, should be successful. But I mean, um, I, I think that this project uh, was successful in terms of uh, just, it helped me in rather than supporting others or supporting the neighbor, rather than supporting the neighborhood, supporting my mother or supporting the viewers, uh, just uh, the most important thing, most important element for me is that it's, it helped me to understand my identity and uh, where I would be going. So then I could be more confident and uh, I think that it made the project uh, more successful than I expected. So just my answer is that that depends on um, any you know artist or the artwork project. But for me, for this project was helpful because at least it helped me a lot to understand about my identity. Yeah. Thank you, Suyun. I have just received some news that I would like to share with you. Uh, Suyun Kim has been chosen as one of the five finalists on the juror shortlist. So that's fantastic news, <laughs> pretty amazing. You're officially running for the $200,000 prize. Thank you, I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We're all excited about it and we congratulate him. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. It was really informative. I appreciated hearing from all of the artists. I have more questions. And uh, right now, we can join the artists in a small reception out in the lobby. I see that everything is set for that. Please feel free to uh, say hello to them, to ask them questions that you have. Uh, this is going to be a really nice time for us. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. <laughs>